Guest Virtual Fellows Sym Symposium. Um, I am Dr. Ranjan Gupta and Dr. Gus Mazaka, and I are the co-chairs uh, of the Education Committee, and we have the pleasure of introducing an extraordinary panel, including Dr. Russ Hoffman, Bernie Mori, Michael Bryan, and Buddy Savoie. With that, I'm going to hand over the moderator president to the past president of pretty much everything in orthopedics. Our society is a, and a, one of the godfathers of our field, Dr. Bernie Mori. Dr. Mori? I want to recommend, and commend, I should say, the uh, organizers for making an. Uh oh. Ranjan, mute yourself. See if that helps. Mike? Yep. We can't hear him. Yeah, you might want to take over and start doing the slides. OK. Unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties, and uh, we cannot hear Dr. Mori's audio. So we're going to go ahead and advance the slides, and hopefully we'll be able to get him back soon. And there we go. So tonight, we're going to be assessing the arthritic elbow. And when you think of this in broad terms, it really boils down to inflammatory arthropathy and non-inflammatory arthropathy. So the two big categories for non-inflammatory arthropathy are primary osteoarthritis and post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Those are the ones that we usually see most frequently. The other ones we do see, but less frequently. So chronic instability or instability arthropathy from medial and lateral ligament tears that go on to instability. OCDs of the capitellum that can displace and progress, as well as avascular necrosis. The inflammatory arthropathies um, can be classified really as infectious and non-infectious. And for the purpose of tonight, we're going to focus on the non-infectious ones, specifically autoimmune, crystalline, neoplastic, neotropic, arteritis, and metabolic. So we've got some cases to go over and highlight these, and we're really going to base this discussion kind of on three main cases and three main treatment options. So we're gonna discuss primary osteoarthritis, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or an inflammatory arthropathy. Sorry. In terms of, terms of treatment options, largely it comes down to six different options. So you can do arthrodesis, resection, osteotomy, debridement, interposition, and replacement. And for most patients that are young osteoarthritic elbows, the top three really do not apply. So arthrodesis is a very limiting surgery, uh, functionally limiting and really hard to live with. So that is really a salvage option when everything else has failed. Similar to resection and osteotomy, resection of the elbow joint leaves someone with very little function and a non-functioning arm. And the elbow doesn't really lend itself to reconstructive osteotomies like you might be able to do in the humerus or the femur. So you're really left with the options of arthroscopic debridement, interposition arthroplasty, and elbow replacement. So these are the topics that we're going to discuss tonight, and we're going to focus on those three broad, broad categories and these three treatment options. And hopefully we'll get Dr. Mori back quickly so we can get him involved in the discussion. This was um, one of Dr. Mori's cases, and this I think he was going to plug in with Dr. Huffman's presentation. This was a patient with Wilson's disease, which is a very rare condition. So he saw this young, uh, woman, 60-year-old woman with Wilson's disease who had severe pain and very limited range of motion from 60 to 90 degrees. And you can see the characteristics of an inflammatory arthropathy here with subchondral erosions, uh, osteopenia, joint destruction, so not characteristic of an osteoarthritis. She underwent an interposition arthroplasty with Achilles tendon graft and at three years was doing very phenomenal. So she was having no pain and a very functional range of motion. So by doing an interposition in this patient with an inflammatory arthropathy, Dr. Mori was able to salvage her elbow joint and give her a very functioning elbow with no real risk of late loosening or hardware failure that you might see with an elbow arthroplasty. Once we get Dr. Mori on, I'll let him comment further on her care. 
This was his uh, update in 2010 on Achilles tendon allograft interposition arthroplasty. And at this time, they had 60 procedures. Um, you can see the pre-op and post-op range of motion went from an arc of about 40 degrees to nearly 90 degrees and 85% were satisfied. So they had very good results using an Achilles tendon allograft for interposition arthroplasty. And I'll let Dr. Mori speak more to this when we get him back on. So I'm gonna to jump to my next case here. And um, so next we're gonna change gears and talk about primary osteoarthritis in the elbow. These are my disclosures. Um, the case we're gonna discuss is a 55 year old right hand dominant female with elbow pain, left elbow pain and arthritis. And her biggest complaint was really loss of motion and pain at terminal extension. So osteoarthritis of the elbow gives you a very predictable history. So patients will get progressive contracture and osteophyte formation, so they will lose flexion and extension, they'll progressively lose motion, and they'll usually have a pain-free mid-range of motion, but they get pain at the end of motion from osteophyte impingement. So the biggest questions to ask are, is their chief complaint pain or stiffness? And for elbow OA, it's usually stiffness. So she had lateral sided pain and her biggest complaint was that she could not be active anymore. She was an avid golfer. She could no longer play golf or exercise because she couldn't extend her arm on a golf swing. She's right-handed, so her left arm was the lead arm. On her exam, here we go. The keys to exam for this are really to look at the end range of motion. And you wanna determine if that end motion has a firm or a soft endpoint. A soft endpoint can sometimes be overcome by stretching and, and bracing. However, a firm endpoint usually is gonna really depict uh, or uh, make you think that there's some bony impingement that physical therapy is not gonna be able to overcome. In this case, she also had a lot of tenderness over her radial head and had crepitus in the radial capitellar joint with forearm rotation. So, when you asked her where it hurt, she pointed right to her radial head and she was having a lot of radial capitellar arthritis. When you look at these radiographs, it's very typical of osteoarthritis, very different from the one that we saw with Dr. Mori's patient. So you'll get joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis. She's got an osteophyte on her olecranon, but her joint architecture is really well preserved. So you don't see any of the subchondral erosions or cysts that you can see with inflammatory arthropathy. So in this case, we tried a cortisone injection, we gave her a topical cream, we put her in physical therapy, she came back eight weeks later and she was largely unchanged. So the cortisone injection helps temporarily, but the physical therapy really did not help her regain any motion. So next we got a 3D CT scan. I think 3D CT scans are very helpful for osteoarthritis because it really helps you identify the osteophytes and plan for your surgical resection. So when you look at the image on the left, looking at the anterior view, she really doesn't have any big osteophytes in her coronoid fossa. The second view shows the olecranon, so she's got osteophytes on the medial and lateral olecranon is a little bit on the ridge of the olecranon fossa. The third view shows the osteophyte on the tip of the olecranon. And then the fourth view also shows that olecranon osteophyte as well as radiocapitellar arthritis. So at this point, her options really are to live with it, an arthroscopic debridement or an arthroplasty. I think interposition arthroplasty is usually going to be indicated more for mid-range joint pain, and she's really not a candidate for a total elbow because she has maintained joint architecture with bony impingement causing her stiffness. So we all know that total elbows in young patients do not do well. There's a high compli I shouldn't say that, they, they're at risk. They have a high complication rate and a high early revision rate. So really for osteoarthritis, Total elbow should really be considered a salvage procedure when other things don't work. So the steps for an arthroscopic release are to identify the ulnar nerve, create a working space, resect the bone spurs first and the capsule second. So the maintained capsule can help you limit swelling. So you do your capsular release at the end. One setup tip for elbow arthroscopy is it's important to have a very wide space between the medial elbow and the body. That's where your scope's going to be when you're coming in from the medial side. So you want to have a nice wide space there so you have plenty of room to work. A quick point on portal principles. Remember that proximal portals are safer than distal portals. This was a cadaveric study. We did it at Tulane. And looking at the lateral portals here, you can see that the direct lateral portal and proximal lateral portal were a safe distance away from the radial nerve. Whereas when you look at that distal lateral portal, it's very close. And in several cases, it actually was in contact with the PIN. 
So to start the case, you want to identify the ulnar nerve. You need to make sure it's in the groove. If it subluxates or if they've had previous surgery, you may dissect the nerve so you know where it is. I still routinely will do this for arthritis cases to do a small incision and put a vessel loop around the nerve so I can do a more aggressive medial release. Once you get in the joint here, we're viewing from the medial side, the shaver's coming in from the lateral side. So first we're gonna clean out all the synovitis, all the loose bodies and bony debris. So as we start to clean this up, you can see the capitellum and the radial header on the left side of the image. You can see a very thickened capsule here in the front. So we're gonna use retractors to help aid our visualization. You can put a switching stick in a high proximal anterolateral portal to lift that capsule away, protect the radial nerve and increase your working space. So now we wanna create our working space. There's a switching stick coming in high, holding the capsule back. And this electrocautery is just releasing that capsule off the proximal humerus to help open up that capsule so we can see. Next, you want to move on to your bony resection and leave your capsule intact. We elected to do a radial head resection in her due to her radiocapitellar arthritis. So you bring a spinal needle in from the soft spot portal so you can get nice and parallel with the radial head. And then you bring a burr in from the soft spot portal. This bone was very hard, so this is a 5-5 burr because the smaller burr just wasn't doing the work. You can use the radial head as a plane, so you can co-plane all the way across, and then by pronating and supinating the forearm, you can fully resect all those osteophytes so you get a nice flat resection. And one of the benefits of doing this arth arthroscopically is you leave the annular ligament intact, so you don't violate the annular ligament or the LCL complex. And then here in a second, we're gonna be viewing from the lateral portal here, so you can see that proximal radial ulnar joint and that we don't have any osteophytes impinging. Next, we'll move on to our capsular release. So the switching stick is holding the capsule tight. This is a straight biter coming in from a direct lateral portal. The direct lateral portal helps you work straight across the front of the joint. You create a plane between the muscle and then release the capsule. And now we're coming in with a shaver and we're releasing the capsule down towards the joint. When you stay up high, the brachialis helps protect you from the radial and median nerves. Then we'll switch and finish on the medial side. So now we're viewing from lateral, the shaver's coming in medial. You can finish any bony work here in the coronoid fossa, resecting osteophytes. You can move down to the tip of the coronoid here. And if you have any bone spurs on the tip of the coronoid you need to resect, you can shave those down and then finish your capsular release across the front. Moving to the back here, the scope is in a posterior central portal and the shaver is coming in from a posterior lateral portal. So first you just want to stay on bone. You're safe inside that olecranon fossa. You can remove the synovium and all the scar tissue and then start working down towards the tip of the olecranon. So now the posterior joint line's coming into view. Here, the scope is in the lateral portal and the burr's coming in in the central portal. Sorry, the quality of this video is not great. So now we can shave down that olecranon spur. And this is where your preoperative CT scan is very helpful. So you can remember the architecture of the bone spurs that you need to remove medial and lateral, remove any scar tissue here between the joint, and then actively flex and extend, passively flex and extend the elbow to make sure there's no bony impingement. Working down the lateral gutter, it's a favorite place for loose bodies to hide. So now the shaver's coming in through that soft spot portal. We've already resected our radial head. We can resect the synovium and the plica and remove any loose bodies in the lateral gutter, rotate the forearm to make sure there's no bony impingement. And finally, the medial release. So oftentimes when there's a flexion contracture, the posterior band of the UCL can be quite tight and thick. So here a straight biter can work straight down. Now this is one reason I like to pull the ulnar nerve out of the way because I know I'm safe. If you don't do an ulnar nerve decompression, you need to be very careful here because the ulnar nerve is going to be just on the other side of that capsular tissue. Here I can go all the way down the medial gutter with the shaver and be quite aggressive because here in a second you're going to see my assistant's finger which is protecting the nerve. So right there is the glove. So his finger is in between the nerve and the capsule. So I would have to shave through his finger to get to the nerve, which would not be very nice. And there's the ulnar nerve with the vessel loop around it. So here's our final range of motion. So she started out with a 40 degree uh, flexion contracture. Now we can easily get her into full extension and all the way up into flexion. And if you just support the hand, you can see how easily they can go into full extension. And I think part of that is being able to not only do the bony resection, but that aggressive medial release as well. Her post-op radiographs show resection of the radial head as well as the resection of the olecranon uh, tip in the back. So the post-op rehab will use a compression sleeve and a cryo-compression device to limit swelling. 
They start immediate PT on post-op day one. You can use nighttime extension splints to help hold that extension. Anytime I do bony work, I usually place them on indomethacin for HO prophylaxis. So just a couple studies. I had to give props to my partner and boss, Buddy Savoy. So he published this in 1999. 24 patients that went an arthroscopic debridement with an outer bridge Kashiwagi procedure. He did a radial head excision in 18 out of 24. And you can see improvements in the VAS and the arc of motion. And interestingly, he found that you should not do a radial head resection in weightlifters because that uh, repetitive loading of the joint can cause them to, co uh, to collapse into a little bit of valgus and progress their own humeral arthritis. Multiple studies have reproduced these results. This year, Grant Garagoose did a systematic review comparing open and arthroscopic osteocapsular arthroplasty and showed that they're basically equivalent. So very similar improvements in outcome scores, flexion, extension, and pain scores. So just in summary, I think the one of the biggest questions to answer is what's their biggest complaint, pain or stiffness? It's usually stiffness. Mid-range pain, might you lead more to consider an interposition arthroplasty? And physical exam, you really want to determine if they have a firm endpoint, which is probably going to determine that you need to do more bony work. I think a 3D CT scan is incredibly helpful in preoperative planning. And at the time of surgery, make sure to protect the ulnar nerve and you can use uh, retractors judiciously to help improve your visualization. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike. We got uh, Dr. Mori on the line. Great. Dr. All right, Mori. Bernie. Uh, this is Bill Levine, and I've got Bernie Mori on my phone. Let's see <coughs> if this works. Go ahead, Dr. Mori. Uh, thank you. First of all, Mike, that was an excellent presentation. I appreciate it very much. What I'd like to do is get the opinions of uh, our panelists or what they think the key points are, or any other additional uh, issues they'd like to uh, bring up with regard to osteoarthritis and arthroscopic uh, debridement, because that is the treatment of choice. In 1,500 total elbows at Mayo, I did a total elbow on only four osteoarthritics. So it's not a total joint operation. So maybe Russ, do you have any comments with regard to the diagnosis, uh, physical exam, or an uh, intervention uh, over and above what's been mentioned. Yeah, I, so I have a couple of comments. Um, one, there was a, a question from the audience about uh, physical examination, about uh, end range of motion pain versus mid arc pain. And I think that's critical in these patients and, and Mike touched on that. If there's mid arc pain, then we're talking about something that's not amenable to osteophyte excision. Um, and we're, you're really looking at an interposition arthroplasty serial injections if appropriate and or a total elbow in those patients if there's in range of motion impingement then it's an arthroscopy is the perfect way to address that that's one thing the second question i, I had a question for you mike um in your radiograph <laughs> the ulnohumeral arthritis was much more advanced than the radiocapitellar arthritis are you concerned in that patient that you've now um uh, that you're going to accelerate the ulnohumeral arthritis, given that you did a radial head resection? A little bit. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, because currently she has no mid-range pain, but now we just removed that lateral column support. That was my so, only concern with the pre-op x-ray. Yeah. Just like, what are your thoughts? You or Buddy both have excellent experience with that. Any thoughts on that? And Buddy's experience is more, my thought on this one was it's her left arm, her biggest sport is golf, and her lead arm in the swing so she's not going to get any type of valgus force on that arm playing golf. So it's not really going to collapse into valgus during her golf swing, or it shouldn't. So there's definitely a concern, but I think based on her non-dominant arm and her sport, hopefully it won't put her at risk. Buddy, what are your Buddy, thoughts? Do you have a comment you wrote in the paper on radio head resection with primary degenerative? So uh, a couple of comments. One is... Uh, on the exam, I tend to load the joint rather than just trying to find where the extensions are. So I'll load the elbow, push on it, and then try to check my mid-range pain. I think that helps. The second, uh, <clears throat> the second point is that your anterior portals, if you're doing an arthritic elbow, need to be moved anterior wherever you are. Uh, we published that paper Mike talked about on the lateral side, but the same thing on the medial side because you have medial osteophytes and it's hard to get around them. So your normal markers don't actually apply. You have to be about five, sometimes eight millimeters more anterior. Those are very safe. We have a paper submitted on that because um, I routinely make my portals more anterior when I do anterior. The third thing is I don't always take the capsule. 
I know Mike showed just an elegant and very well done capsule resection, but a lot of my arthritics, um, if I do sufficient bone work and take care of everything, whether it's, it, it, it's taking away a bit of the bone above the capitellum like Sean O'Driscoll taught us, or, or taking away the radio head, but if I do good bone work, I should get all the motion back. So I don't necessarily do the capsule release to the point where I'll come back anteriorly after I've done everything and check my motion and make sure it's normal. Then the last thing is, as Bernie and Mike alluded to, if you have radial sided loading and any instability, you never take the radial head. And so one of the things we found way back in the early 90s was that with bench pressers, they may have a terrible looking elbow on x-ray. And, but if you take their radial head, as soon as they start to lift with a wide grip bench press, they're gonna start shifting out the back and the elbow is gonna progress. And these are not people you can put a total elbow in because they may tell you they're gonna modify their activities, but they're not. And so on those people, no matter how bad that side of the joint looks, we leave it alone. Hey buddy, it's Bill, can you hear me? Yes. Can I, can, I, uh, can I probe you a little bit more on, on that comment you made? Absolutely. Because, because if we had a total, if we had an arthritic shoulder and we went in and took out all the bone spurs but didn't do a capsulotomy or a capsulectomy, we wouldn't improve their motion. And, and I'm hard, having a hard time understanding how you're saying now that you wouldn't take the capsule if you just take out the bone spurs. Seems to me your caps are contractured is a major part of the pathology. So help us understand that, thanks. Sure, so what happens, what I think happens in an elbow, and it's, it's proven out over many, many years, is that the capsule actually wraps around the spurs. So when you look at the elbow, you're gonna have medial spurs above the joint, you're gonna have lateral spurs above the joint. So the capsule actually expands when that happens. So you think it's tight because you've lost motion. And as you know, I don't have any problem at all releasing the capsule. I wrote that paper as well. But for arthri purely arthritic elbows, not post-traumatics, but degenerative arthritis of the elbow, those, those bone spurs make the capsule actually larger. So if you really can get out all the spurs, which is we're moving the portals more anteriorly, you can access all those spurs in the front and the back, then you're not gonna have that problem. Now, if it's a post-traumatic arthritic elbow, you're definitely gonna have capsular contractures. We always take the anterior capsule, always elevate the triceps in the back, and always release the posterior band. But as a primary osteoarthritic, I've not found that to be necessary. Thanks. Can I, can I make a quick point here? One of the things that you gotta understand is primary OA of the elbow is different from any other joint. The articular surface is usually preserved in some marginal disease. The elbow lays down osteophytes on the margin of the articulation as Buddy implied. So if you release only the osteophytes, the average increased arcomotion motion is 20 degrees in our experience. Most people aren't complaining about loss of motion, they're complaining about impingement. So Bill, you're right, it's absolutely different from the shoulder. We get a significant improvement in motion by osteophyte removal, removal of impingement pain, and these patients are very satisfied with those two elements, and you avoid the morbidity of a capsulotomy. So that's actually uh, becoming, I think, pretty well uh, appreciated. Uh, I think that's a good discussion. That's probably the most common thing that uh, our fellows will see. They'll learn arthroscopy. They'll see a lot of primary OA. So there are some very important points. We'll try to maybe summarize those at the end. Uh, the next patient that you'll see that is under 60 with a, an arthritic condition, of course, is an inflammatory process. There's a whole host of them, as I showed on that, showed on that slide earlier. And uh, Russ will discuss his uh, management of this uh, using a uh, juvenile rheumatoid as an example, Russ. Yep. Do you, uh, do you need me to share my screen to show that? Yes. I think my yes, duty is to release control of that. I hit stop sharing. Does that open it up for you? Um, let's see. So far, it's not given me the ability to do it. And uh, if need be, I could jump off and then jump back on, and then that would open it up for you. Oh, would it? Huh. I don't know. But uh, I hit no, stop. Give it to me now. Okay. Yep, it just popped up. Okay. Let me get my...
All right. Um, if you all can see that. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, let's see. It's kind of freezing my screen here. Let's see if we can get it going. All right. Um, So I don't have any disclosures relevant to this topic. Um, the patient I wanted to discuss uh, is from our children's hospital. Um, at the time she was uh, that I met her initially, she was 17 years old and uh, presented with a severe systemic polyarticular uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis presentation. And this is a picture of her um, <clears throat> in her fixed position. Her arms were locked straight. Um, her hips were fused uh, and her knees were fused um, and her legs are kind of in a windswept position. So <clears throat> she was also uh, going blind from uveitis uh, and has had many eye issues since then. Um, but as you can see, the position of her arms uh, and the radiographic uh, fusion of both the ulnohumeral and uh, uh, radial uh, capitellar joints uh, has left her unable to do any self-care. She can't feed herself. Uh, she can't do any self, <clears throat> self-care self at all. Um, so her father would literally lift her, carry her everywhere. She could, was unable to do transfers. They had to feed her, uh, you know, as if she were a baby. Um, so she's very debilitated at the time that I met her. Um, and her number one complaint was uh, she wanted to be able to walk, but her, her first thing was she just wanted to be able to feed herself and touch her face and uh, do some self-care. So I just threw this slide up uh, for, the, for the other panel members. Um, I mean, some of the options that we would do in less severe inflammatory arthritis cases would include uh, an injection. I'll, I'll inject these patients routinely if they have the first presentation of, of rheumatoid arthritis with synovitis and even mild losses of motion. And um, it's also a group that I uh, have good success doing arthroscopy on. Arthrodesis in an inflammatory patient, not so much. And I know some of the panel members have said arthrodesis is off the record. Two of my, my happiest patients have had arthrodesis after having eight or 10 surgeries elsewhere. And they're in their <clears throat> 30s, 40s, and wanted one additional procedure. Um, now, I can take a, an arthrodesis down later and do an elbow replacement if, if I had to, uh, but for one procedure in someone that young, uh, in my hands, there's a very limited indication, but I, I think a fusion is actually a good option, so I have to disagree with the rest of the panel, um, or at least what's been said so far. And then the last option would be something like an interposition or uh, an elbow arthroplasty. Um, this is not one of my inner positions, but it's one that we see that comes in infected not uncommonly. And with Scott Levin, sometimes we see bones sticking out, uh, implants sticking out, where we're doing free flaps and reconstructing the elbow. So I don't know if any of the panel members, I'll just stop and ask any of the panel members what they would do with this patient. Um, any thoughts, buddy? So... I mean, this is clearly very bad, um, as you know, and JRAs are a, a kind of a different ball game. And so they'll tolerate a lot of deformity. I tend to work through it stepwise, just like you said. I do injections. I do the arthroscopic debridement. If you get to end stage, um, I haven't had the same success with interposition in my rheumatoid patients uh, as, as Bernie has. And so I tend to move on those to earlier arthroplasty. Part of it is the JRAs, even with the DMARs, still get a lot of deformity. They're not very active. They're not doing much. So it's, it's more like the old days where your rheumatoid patients are pretty much happy with whatever you did because you got rid of their pain and their functional level was so low that if they can touch their nose and their mouth, they do better. So for me and this patient, careful consideration. I'm not a, an, uh, an arthrodesis fan. I've done a few, been pretty happy with the ones, but I'm very selective. I would probably lean more towards arthroplasty in a JRA patient with deformity and a lot of, if I, if I got to the point of having surgery. 
I would try to delay that as long as possible, but the elbow critical in rheumatoids. Mike, uh, is, is this patient too young to do a total elbow in your practice? <laughs> well, you would hope, but I think you're, you're down that road where there's nothing else really left, you know, because I think an, an arthroscopic debridement when less severe uh, deformity just to remove the synovium and try and give them some pain relief can be very helpful. But once the disease has progressed this far, I think that's, in my opinion, I agree with you, that's the best option to give them function in that elbow. Um, I don't have experience with elbow arthrodesis in young patients for JRA, so I would be more likely to go to an arthroplasty before an arthrodesis. Dr. Mori, you're the uh, you've written more on this than uh, than all of us. No, there's no question in my mind today, not maybe 30 years ago, but I do an interposition first because in my experience they actually do pretty well, very well. Um, one of the problems with JRA is stiffness and spontaneous fusion. And here's a very important point that's never talked about. When you're talking about a JRA, particularly like your patient. One operation isn't going to help. If they got a fused elbow, fused hip, fused knees, you've got to think of the whole sequence. And so the question that I ask is, if I can get your elbow to move through some range of motion and it doesn't hurt, what's going to be the next joint that you're going to have a problem with? Because you want to figure out how many operations is this person going to need in order to be functional. And that kind of puts a burden on the operation you're going to do because that's your foundation or somewhere in the chain. So to me, in this patient, which is an impossible patient, <laughs> which you did a great job on, but for me, one of the most important uh, things to kind of share with the fellows is, think about how much one operation, how much good that one operation is gonna do for the patient, and then what's the second operation that is gonna be a benefit to them functionally, and then you ask, what's the likelihood of success? So you can say, theoretically, do an interposition, but if it's got a 30% chance of success and everything hinges on it, then that's a foolish approach. Then you do a total joint, say it's not going to go forever, but it's going to work for a while. So to me, the sequence is very important in your own experience. My experience with inflammatory, and I have a slide in here that may or may not have gotten lost, is that they do as well as post-traumatic, about 85% in eight years. So I, I would offer a little girl like this a... a a, a, a interposition unless she said just get rid of my pain get rid of my pain then it's a total joint she said i want to have motion and i don't want to be limited by restrictions it's interposition so my my experience has been more like uh uh buddies i interposition for me has worked better for um uh, some of the post-traumatics and not as well for me in in the inflammatory uh, conditions, but I, we did show your slide. Mike showed your slide earlier, showing that in your uh, hands, uh, post-traumatics and inflammatories did as well. So for me, this I knew this patient had upcoming knee and hip replacements as well, um, but I did do uh, elbow replacements. And I actually, uh, this is these are some slides from other data, not Dr. Mori's. Uh, historically, interposition has not done as well in inflammatory. Uh, conditions. However, Dr. Mori has, has one of the bigger series and uh, actually does have equivalent. But when I, I got to say, I was surprised by that because I, I thought we were going to double down and prove that they didn't do as well. But, yeah. but in our series, they didn't have any, I mean, literally, that, that's worth when two or three points of each other and satisfaction was two or three points. So it surprised me. I wasn't expecting. So in this, in this patient, I did choose to do elbow uh, arthroplasty because in my hands, I thought that was the more reliable uh, treatment. And I did both in the same surgical setting. Uh, it was one of the few patients where I've done that with a shoulder or elbow and both the ones where I've done bilaterals have been young cancer patients who are either traveling from a distance or have uh, other issues. So um, she did, uh, this is her, she was named her prom queen after total elbows, um, not because of the elbow replacements, but uh, um, but was able to move on to that and then subsequently had uh, hip and knee replacements done in a staged fashion. So actually her total elbows were the, were the only ones that were done simultaneously. Um, they're still her favorite joints, I have to say. 
And that's because shoulder and elbow surgeons just help people more than others sometimes. Um, tongue in cheek, that is. So um, looking at the overall uh, Orthoplasty experience, and I, again, the Mayo experience is, is probably the, by far the best in the world, and I think in the United States, certainly it's it's the broadest experience we have. For the fellows, I'll say that this is a trend that we see uh, in our practices that rheumatoid cases have gone down, and trauma cases have gone way up. And I would also say that in most people's hands, osteoarthritics in post-traumatic cases both have higher failure rates than rheumatoids, unlike uh, that this study here. Um, and I'm not gonna belabor different implants. Uh, the Coonrad Mori by far, even in this study, has uh, the longest track record. You can see that even at nine years out, there's still 60 patients, where some of the newer implants, uh, Nexel has no six-year follow-up in this. So, however, they all seem to cluster fairly similarly. So it probably depends on what's comfortable in your own hands. Um, looking strictly at inflammatory arthropathy in young patients, there, there is evidence for good results in these patients uh, internationally. And I think you guys will get some of these references, so I'm not gonna belabor these points. Um, hey, Ross, Ross, what did you do with the triceps? Uh, one of the people wanna know, how did you handle the triceps for the, her? Well, because she was fused in extension, um, I could not do a triceps on. Um, that's my preference in most arthroplasty. Um, in this particular case, I actually had to lengthen her left triceps substantially. Um, and <clears throat> given her state, the, her bone was very soft at the fusion site. Um, so these were both very difficult cases. Um, I did a, I did a uh, Mori approach, um, a Brian Mori approach. So I, I went medial exposed the ulnar nerve, and then raised a, a flap of the extensor mechanism in continuity with the ankyneus. Uh, so. Um, Russ, did you have to do a VY lengthening or anything like that to the triceps? On the left side, I did. Um, okay. And that was just to gain more flexion because um, that side was a little more affected in terms of the extra articular adhesions. So. Um, the one thing I want to point out for the fellows is uh, the revision-free survivorship uh, in inflammatory arthropathy. This is the Mayo experience. Um, and Dr. Mori could give us some inside tips on this. Um, if you look at aseptic loosening, it's actually quite low in, in lower demand rheumatoid arthritic patients. Um, whereas if you add in infection and other causes, uh, the, the failure rate goes up. And that's kind of the opposite of what we see in post-traumatics and osteoarthritics. This is one of Dr. Mori's patients who is 21 years out um, or 20 years out um, and had a total elbow done at the age of 20. That was the closest I could find to our reference patient here without any real evidence of aseptic loosening uh, 20 years out from the uh, implant with excellent results. It's what we're hoping for in mind. This is six years out. Um, she has no pain. The right side, um, I don't know if the video will play, <clears throat> she actually has um, functional range of motion. Um, let me see if we can get to that. Um, so the right side uh, is seen in the, uh, in the right lower panel. <clears throat> so pretty good motion at six years out, no pain. The left side where I had to lengthen the triceps, um, you'll see on the lower left-hand side uh, has limited flexion. She gets about to 95, 100 degrees, uh, has near full extension, um, but she's right-hand dominant. She is pre-medical student now and has done well, uh, and her total elbows did carry her through the, the lower extremity joint replacement. So that's that's my presentation here. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, let me make one real quick technical point that I've seen many mistakes made. If you go back to your slide, oh, yeah. ulnar rheumatoids will sometimes not have a medullary canal in their own. I mean, it's amazing. If you look at th those x rays, yeah. I mean, Russ, you probably had to pray with the burr. At least I've had to do that before. Most common yeah. mistake made in preoperative planning and total elbow is not paying attention to the dimensions of the ulna and the bow of the ulna. Because yeah. those are the critical 
uh, tolerance uh, components of the procedure. Triceps on is very important to ankle point, but I just want to make that since I've seen more than one major error of implant coming through the uh, cortex and uh, bowed, no canal, juvenile rheumatoid patients. So those implants were placed perfectly for what that's worth. Uh, buddy, any comments? Uh, I know you uh, do joints also, as well as all expertise in arthroscopy. So no, I thought I think Russ did a great job. I, I was very impressed with that. And I thought to me the hardest part is always aligning the prosthesis with crooked bones in the rheumatoids because they bow a lot. And Russ, those were fabulous, were very well done. Um, that's the one thing that you know the the if you malalign just a little bit, you'll get bushing wear early, and and you'll have yes. to change it out, which is another operation. And so the fact that she's made it this far is excellent. I usually tell them. But if the bone doesn't give way, then the little plastic part that connects the two may do so around 10 years, but it's not as big a surgery. Yeah. Good point. Uh, and that reminds me, one other thing, if you got a real tiny bone like that and you can't get the full length of the implant down, the, the drug reps, if any of them are on, should leave now. But I just cut the implant off yeah, yeah. and get it short. There's no reason in the world to keep a normal st length stem and stick it out in the cortex. So don't hesitate to pay attention to what you're doing. Pay a lot of attention to the bow and the APM lateral. So the rule of eight, that is about an eight degree angulation, eight centimeters distal to the articulation. And if you got an implant that's much longer than that, you're, you may have to bend it. So pay a lot of attention to owner dimensions. Michael, uh, anything from your perspective? No, sir. I have nothing to add after the two foremost elbow experts in the world. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you in that. Full of baloney. No, no, no. Speak. Nothing to add, sir. To have the world's expert on a lot of things, and not on that, you will lead our orthopedic specialty in the next couple of years. So we're very honored to have Buddy with us. Thanks, Buddy, for joining, and uh, we look forward to your uh, okay. discussion of post trauma conditions. All right, so we're going to do post traumatic young patients. So this is a 39 year old, we'll do, we'll, if we have time, we'll do another one at the end. 39 year old fitness buff, she fell off her bike and supposedly broke her radial head. She was not my patient at this time, but this was her initial post-op x-ray. Now, when you look at this, there's a few things that are concerning. One is the, the radial head is angled a bit, probably not great. There is some medial sided injury over here. I don't know if you can see my arrow on the AP, but primarily on the lateral, if you look at it, we don't have our normal capitellar contour and the radio head is sitting out the back. And then um, again, on, going back to the AP, you can see that this is really lengthened a little bit, not short, because if you look at the, the, the part of the proximal radio ulnar joint, it's actually longer than that. Um, and then the same thing on the lateral view where it looks like it's just pushing the capitellum in. And so, she was not doing well um, at this point, clearly. So we don't know what approach was used, but she was having pain. She was stiff, um, clearly couldn't work out, but her biggest point, biggest complaints at this point was she couldn't reach her mouth, she couldn't do her hair, she couldn't do anything like that, not, not to mention the gym. And so clearly there's a problem. And I would submit to the fellows who are listening that the unstable stiff elbow is really a problem because it's hard to figure out what to do. So her doctor, really good physician, uh, went back in and thought that the problem was that the radio head was too short. And so one of the things we'll talk about at the end, if we have a little bit of time, is how do you really judge that? So he put in a thicker, longer, different radio head. Um, if you look at, on, the, on the lateral view we're showing, there's a bit of a step cut, so you're missing some radius. Again, you see the capitellar issue. You're starting to see some arthritis at the ulnohumeral joint already. And so then this was revised pretty quickly, like at about six weeks. Um, Opnote said nothing about working on the ligaments on the lateral side. She got more stiff, more popping, more pain, had about a 20 degree arc of motion, very little if any pronation and supination. And so she felt worse um, at that point. So. They went back and tried to do a manipulation under anesthesia, which is a whole nother ballpark of discussion. Um, that didn't work at all. And so when she came to see me, her main complaint was loss of motion. She said, if you can get it to where I can touch my nose, I'll be happy. And so 
one of the things, so we went in and did that. We took out the radio head, we cleaned everything out, um, kind of reconstructed the, both the medial side and the lateral side with repairing as best we could, trying not to do grafts at that point, which in, in hindsight was a mistake. Um, and then you can see we got out most of the HO, we left a, little, a few little pieces. Also noticed with the arthroscopy that about half of the anterior capitellum was missing. Um, but at this point, we were just going for motion. That's all she wanted to do at that point. I, I really, we talked about doing a lot more stuff, but again, very young, wanted to get back in the gym. This is all she wanted to do. So here, this work actually worked out pretty well. She got 20 to 125. She went back to the gym. She could do her makeup. She could do her hair. She's a very pretty lady. Um, and then went back, of course, with, without me really suggesting it, into weight training and high-intensity workouts. Started having more crepitation, pain increased. This is one of the things we talked about with Mike's case earlier in taking out the radio head. So this is violating one of my rules, which is never do the radio head or take out the radio head in, an, in a, a very active arthritic power lifter, weight lifter, that kind of thing. She did not want to decrease her activities. The reason we took hers out is, is somebody had already resected it and put in a replacement and the replacement was causing eccentric wear on the capitellum. So now she's about 43. Her partner's this huge guy. I mean, he's clearly a bodybuilder. I mean, um, makes like four of me. Uh, and so he says, I want my workout partner back. We lift weights all the time. This is what we do. This is how we met. So they're, they're very concerned at this point. So now what are your options in doing this? You cannot do a total elbow because if she has no pain, she's going to be lifting as heavy as possible and she's going to pop it. And I think that'll be a problem. So she's still a little bit unstable posterior laterally. We need to do a graft there, but we got to do something because the ulnar humeral joint is deteriorating. So she has that central arthritis. You compress this in the middle and it's grinding, popping. So what are we going to do? So we did an interposition. Um, learned this from Bernie. Instead of doing the Achilles, I may come back to regret this later on, we did it with a dermal graft. We revised the radial head because I wanted to put something back in. Tried to bone graft the anterior capitellum and put the dermal graft around that capitellar part. Reconstruct the entire lateral ligament complex and then added an internal joint stabilizer with a bit of distraction. So it's not exactly where Dr. Orbe talks about putting it, but we distracted it some so that we would take pressure off that joint. Um, this is the internal brace going in. You can see sutures pulling the different ligaments and grafts, trying to repair everything that was left, adding a graft in and around it so that we can put it back. So that's our graft coming in, reconstructed the annular ligament going all the way back up to the top, a second limb coming around the back. Um, she was very happy. I splinted her for a week because it's a big operation. Said it was the first time in four years she was pain free, had excellent range of motion. This is what our x-rays look like. Didn't have to refix the medial side. For those of you that have used this device, this is a little bit further down the ulna, and that was on purpose because we're trying to make a gap here at the ulnar humeral articulation. So at this point, she's pretty happy. Radio has not perfectly lined up with the capitellum. It is here, but on this one, it still kind of wants to slip back, but not very much. Um, and let me back up a step if I can. If you see the this on this point right here, this is a very thin fit individual. So the one thing about this device, if you use it, is it does be a little proud here. So if you're thin, you can actually palpate this. And she started palpating that over the next six months and didn't like it. So we went back and took it out. Took it out, said you might get some pain back. Um, she actually felt pretty good. So we took that out. This is our sort of reconstructed capitellum. Um, the pin was up here. This is one of the tunnels for the graft. We've got a, ra a wrap around here. You can see the little holes where we put that in. And then on the lateral, we're actually lined up. And if you look where I put the red arrow, we have the ulnar humeral articulation gapped and open, and that's where my graft is. And so now she's doing pretty well. She works out. She was pain-free with the IJS in, is not pain-free right now, but rates it as a two. She's back in the gym. She's lifting weights. She's doing what she wants to do. She and her husband have not divorced. Um, because they were able to work out together. And then uh, really quickly, uh, I'm gonna skip the discussion. I wanna go to this last case. We'll go very quickly. Um, just to let you know that if you get in over your head, just kind of stop and ask for help. This was a fracture uh, in an 83 year old. The, the guy that was on call that night uh, doesn't do elbows. He's just said, well, I'm gonna just do the best I can. Um, we've actually talked about this. This was his initial fixation um, when she came back for her first post-op visit. 
and he went, oh, I just missed everything. Screws are coming loose. I don't know what to do. So he went back and did it again and got worse. Um, and so you can see now everything's falling apart. Um, and so uh, kept trying, uh, decided that he'd wash it out a little bit because now she started draining. Um, got even worse after that. And so then he went back, took everything out, put an X fix. Now, problem here, if you look carefully, is it's still not lined up. So the, the joint is not congruent. So if you're going to try to immobilize someone, you at least want it to be congruent. The wire is an antibiotic spacer to try to take care of the infection. This is where she ended up. Um, I think we would all agree it's probably not a great situation. She was painful, popping. And so finally, I got to take a look at her. Um, she rated her pain as an 8 out of 10 at rest. So she can't eat. She can't transfer. She can't dress. Fourth and fifth fingers are numb. She was given a brace. This is not a thin fit woman. You'll see her in a second because she gave permission um, uh, for us to use her videos and stuff. But every time she tried to use it, it would dislocate. So the question then, is there anything you can do? And so the answer is, of course, there's always something we can do. We might make her worse, but we're going to try. So she's prone here. And we're looking at the kind of mass of bone moving over here. Um, and then this is where things, we kind of took everything apart. Here's her ulna. Um, that's her form. We can now get our pronation and supination back with our release. This is what's sort of left of the humerus, and we took that out as well. So you can see how this will fit together. And so we took it all apart, put it all back together, put a total elbow in, got rid of the bone. Bernie sort of talked about this a little bit, shorten it, make sure it goes in place. And then this is where we end up. So pronation and supination are good. She can touch her nose. She's very happy. The arm's doing really well. Of course, she fell a year later and broke her shoulder and her hip because um, uh, it's not the best bone in the world. But as long as she can do that, and if you look very carefully, we're cheating because we're not working on extension. She's got her arm resting on there. So we, she has triceps weakness. And so this was March of this year, right before the pandemic, which is her last, last time I got to saw her, I got to see her um, and just check on her there. So. I think we'll stop the, the slides at that point and, and have discussion. Should be pretty good discussion, I think. Um, if I can figure out how to stop this. Great job. Um, let's see. Uh, um, Gus or uh, Bernie, you want to go first? Yeah, we've, we've got a few questions that the guys have been as asking. Uh, uh, one question came in, Bernie, about some non operative options. Uh, for arthritis and will people consider PRP? Um, Russ said that he's done some off-label visco supplementation. So maybe Bernie, you want to start uh, asking about or talking about your yeah. thoughts on, on non-operative but um, injection type treatments for uh, arthritic elbows. The, the panelists did a good job, I think, of emphasizing that uh, primary osteoarthritis typically does not have joint arc pain. Joint arc pain responds to visco supplements and PRP. When you got a mechanical impingement that is causing the pain, you can do the non-op. It's a freaking waste of time because they have an established <laughs> problem that you can address. Now, if they have pain through the mid-arc, then getting rid of impingement is, you know, whistling. So in that instance, then I would consider PRP or visco supplement, but you pay close attention and understand what you're doing. It isn't a matter of closing your eyes and shooting into the dark. So I, I think uh, it's a waste of time to do very much conservative for primary osteoarthritis. Unlike hip, knee, and shoulder, I try to make that point. They're very different diseases of the elbow. If you look at the x-rays, elbows have normal joint spaces when they have primary osteoarthritis. It's a marginal disease. If you get a, a, a three-dimensional reconstruction, you'll see that there's a, and I had a slide in there, I think I thought, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's an osteophyte around the margin of the trochlea, around the margin of the radial head, and you get rid of the, and that causes impingement, you get rid of that, and you, you've kind of cleared it. So I don't think you can use it if you're not sure what to do and you want to pat them on the head and look left and go right. But it's not a real main mainstream treatment, in my opinion. My others may have a different opinion and experience. Dr. Mori, I have, I have a question for you, um, a technical question for you, uh, Buddy or Mike, regarding uh, interposition arthroplasty. So 
Um, in, in Buddy's case, he used an IJS, and you've written extensively in the past about distraction of your um, interpositions. Are you still advocating for distraction at the time of interposition arthroplasty? Um, and if so, for how long and what's your rationale for that? Yeah, I, I had a case I, was, I tried to show of a lady in three years, but uh, not, I, I distract about 90% of them. The rationale is real simple. I have to take down the lateral collateral to do the interposition the way I do it. So I have to protect against the, the uh, valgus stress or varus stress while that's healing. The other thing is if you if you load with dynamic motion the elbow while the interposition is healing, I suspect it could, in theory, that it could interfere with the healing membrane. So I want the elbow to float around the trochlea in the early stages. So I put on an X-fix and I uh, distracted two to three, at most four millimeters. So I'm protecting the collateral ligament and I'm protecting the uh, interposed membrane. However, the, the real secret value of that is I take it off in three weeks. I put it under an anesthesia. When I put them under an anesthesia, I take the pins out and I stretch them out. And, I, and some might call it a manipulation, but I don't. I call it an exam under anesthesia. And that's when I get their arc back. So now in three weeks, they're a boost down the road to recovering their arc motion. The lady whose uh, uh, slides I had embedded somewhere has an arc of about 25 to 130 degrees in three years for Wilson's disease, and she was ankylosed before I operated on her. And uh, the other thing I'd mention about interposition, which is really important, is it, if they have really, really good function, don't take an x ray. Because the x rays usually look horrible. <laughs> and, and the, the male uh, uh, performance scores are not very good, but the margin of where they start and where they end is actually pretty good. And in our patients, we had 50 some odd, no, 60, I think, in eight years, and 85% said they'd have it again. Their average MEP scores were 75. So, uh, you know, you got to understand what you're, you're kind of dealing with with the interposition. But that's kind of the lost art. I mean, what do we have for the elbow? We don't, we don't have Jack, really, in a way. We've got, you know, we're going to thank God for osteoarthritis and different disease and arthroscopy, thanks to Buddy and others, that show us how to treat that. And then we got total joints. And so if we can learn to do interpositions, it's really, really, really helpful in that, in that very young person that really needs something other than a joint and arthroscopy is going to help. Any, uh, uh, any other questions, Bill, or um, any, other, any other comments? One of the things the team thought we would do is, I hope you appreciate a lot of time went into this from, from our uh, participants and uh, a lot of really good points that sometimes may get missed uh, because we're trying to cover a lot of ground. So we thought we'd kind of put together the pearls and the salient points. And it's a three by three matrix. There's three diseases, osteoarthritis, inflammatory, and post-trauma. And there's three viable options, arthroscopy, debridement, interposition, and total joint. So we thought we would try to put together a paper that talks about the highlights and the features to consider in that kind of three by three matrix. And then we'd send it to somebody, Gus or Raj or somebody, Bill, and uh, let you guys decide what to do with it, if anything, you know, with the fellows. Thanks very much, Bernie. Um, Ranjan, you want the last word? Sure, thank you very much, Dr. Mori. We appreciate the, your tremendous efforts and everyone else, Dr. Savoie, Mike, Russ, oh yeah. we will, we will the, that three by three matrix, Dr. Mori, we'll, we'll include that in the recording for the fellows when we post it a little later on. And uh, thank you everyone for your time and your energies. We appreciate everything. Thank you. Well, let me just make a comment. The guys put together great cases. And then they all had to abbreviate it, so they had to spend a lot of time twice. And I just want to recognize <laughs> that, uh, that great effort. <laughs>